Hey, this is Aki, and you're with me on Owl. All right, guys, so we are here with Aki. How's it going? It's good, thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so I always like to start with a positive focus, so something you are either excited about or grateful for. Great. Um, so I'm really excited for my next upcoming set, which is going to be at Mysteryland. Um, it's my second time playing Mysteryland this year, and mm -hmm. it's the only festival I've played, so I'm really excited to play that again. Something I'm grateful for that I was just thinking about last night is actually how much I'm grateful for the support community I have in New York for my music passions and how they've just been with me throughout my entire journey. Um, and no matter like where I am, no matter what time I'm playing, they're always coming out to support me and make sure that I'm okay. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about that. Like how did you end up in New York? Like when did you start playing music? And how's your fan base grown ever since you started? So I moved to New York for university. Um, moved here from Singapore, grew up in Australia in Singapore. Um, went to Columbia University uptown. Um, was always passionate about music, like here and there, but really didn't know exactly what I wanted to do with it. So I was joining like dance teams, I was in, like singing classes, I was messing around with production a little bit, but I didn't really do much about it. Mm -hmm. And then I think it was just like two years after graduating college, I was still in New York, I just decided to stay here and work here mm -hmm. um, in a day job. And um, it just hit me that I really want to learn how to DJ. Um, and then I enrolled in classes. It just so happened that a friend of mine, a friend of a friend, co-founded Scratch DJ Academy. Mm -hmm. So I enrolled in classes there um, and then just wanted to kind of play live out like as soon as possible. Um, and then I think at first my friends were like, oh, like, what is this new thing that she's doing? And then when they came out and saw how passionate I was about what I do, that's when they got super supportive and just continuously um, came out like over and over again, like the more I played and they've just like, been with me as I grew. And then um, as I did that more consistently, that fan base just gradually expanded beyond my media network and I started seeing people that I didn't actually know come mm -hmm. out to my shows because they would have like heard about me through something and that's when you know like you're really expanding and growing because it's not just people you're directly inviting anymore, it's people that are actually familiar with your music. Yeah. And I will say that that's how we ended up here because yeah. I was there supporting my other friends, Lin and Wu, and I saw your set and your energy and it was so amazing. So I came up to you and I was like, hey, do you want to be featured? <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I just learned about you and I think you're incredible. Oh, thank you yeah. so much. And that's great because you don't, like, when you're an opener, like, you don't always, like, have people, like, really pay much attention to the opener because they're really just there to warm up the scene. Mm -hmm. But I'm so grateful that you were there, you were paying attention, you were getting involved and, you know, I'm just really happy about that. Yeah. Um, what would you say has been the biggest challenge so far of just being in this industry? I think the biggest challenge so far has just been um, to just be patient all the time because like when you're passionate about something um, you can tend to get a little frustrated if things just don't happen like overnight, happen mm -hmm. instantaneously and throughout my journey I was just seeing how there are so many things that are happening now that I just wasn't ready for before and even though back then I wanted that to happen I really just wasn't ready like until now I needed to grow, I needed to learn more about music, I needed to meet people, I needed to collaborate with more people. I really just needed a better sense of identity before playing the kind of shows and playing the kind of music that I'm playing like right now. Mm -hmm. So I think the challenge there um, is you know, being patient. I think another challenge is definitely being a woman. <laughs> you know, there are so many, um, when, I, when I first like entered the scene, I just felt like a lot of the men in the scene really kind of like banded together and there wasn't as much space for women to just kind of like come in and you didn't, you, didn't, you felt a little like less supported from that perspective because a lot mm -hmm. of guys just kind of put their bros for like yeah. shows and kind of they're always just hanging out together and it's not the same for women like we, we can't always like we can't always do that mm -hmm. um so that was just a little frustrating sometimes I felt like I always had to like consistently prove myself um, before being accepted as an equal. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely getting better, and as I get more and more into the community, um, I have a really good supportive network of artists, both men and women, um, who see me like as an equal now and don't treat me any differently just because I'm, like, I'm a woman. Yeah, do you feel like that's still like a continuous battle though? And do you feel like that's pretty general for like all women in the industry? Um, it's interesting. I think that I think the biggest battle for women is that we're not 
I think we're, we're, we're not like instantly kind of put on a pedestal as some men are, right? Like, if a lot of the times so when like a guy releases a track, there's almost no question that he did it himself. If a girl releases a track and it's really good, sometimes we'll just like, she so those produced it. Yeah, <laughs> those producers, did she really do this herself? And I've not only heard that, um, I've not only been questioned about that, but I've heard of other people talk about other female artists like that, like, oh, that track was so good that she definitely didn't do it herself. And I was like, how, how could you just say that? I just assumed that without like knowing any better, you know? So I think that's the challenge, but I think it's also a pretty cool challenge to have because you want to lead by example. Like, I want to work really hard be really familiar with production, like do it right, do it well, so that you know there's absolutely no question, there's no skeletons in my closet. If I release something, I did it, um, unless otherwise stated. If I collaborate, then I state that I had a collaborator. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so what's cooking in the studio right now? What can we expect in the next year or so? So, um, I was working on a couple of tracks since I released my um, most recent remix, which is actually with um, End to End, my friend Nick. Um, it was a remix of Seven Weekends. Um, Great track. Lost. <laughs> yeah, I love it. It did really well. Um, uh, it topped a lot of the hype and charts, and uh, one of Pete Tong's agents like picked it up. So that was really inspiring. That was a big move. Yeah. Um, since then, I haven't really released anything just because I've been really trying to figure out the kind of sound that I want to go for. Mm -hmm. um, especially because it will be my first independent release. The past three were collaborations with other artists, and I kind of was working on two more, um, I guess like gangster house sounding <laughs> tracks and yeah. then I just saw such an influx of that sound that it just doesn't feel different anymore. And then I, um, I sat there one day and I was thinking, okay, why am I here in the first place? Like what, what, could make, what, what makes me different? And I realized there's so many cultural influences from all over the world. I should really be trying to show that more through my music. So I'm now actually collaborating with a three-piece um, live band who are actually based out of Harlem and we're working on this kind of um, Afrobeat, Afrotech sample track which I'm really excited about because it sounds really different yeah. and I think it could actually like deliver a completely new sound that I think we've been missing for a little while. Can't wait so to hear it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and for those that haven't caught you live yet, like what type of emotion do you want your audience and the crowd to feel when you're playing? I really want them to feel my energy. Um, I really want them to feel like, you know, I really want them to kind of just forget where they came from and just like be in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a lot of what I work to do and the environment I work to create. So for example, the Feed Me Disco set that you came out to, um, a really good friend of mine had her her brother and her sister-in-law visiting from France and yeah. they're like a little older. Yeah. And this was so lovely to hear, but afterwards she was like, you know, I think my brother and my sister-in-law just like forgot about all their stress like at home um, just for that night and like, we just make sure they had a good time and mm -hmm. that's exactly what I want. Like, I just want people to like leave their worries at the door, really indulge in the moment, whether or not they like house music, they don't like house music, you know, just try to be open to something new. Yeah, and you were having a good time. You were like dancing on stage <laughs> and everything. I know. I just cannot control myself. I try so hard sometimes to control a little bit. It's okay. It's <laughs> yeah. Um, so what's been like some of your, who has been some of your biggest musical influences and what yeah. do you listen to outside of let's say dance music? Yeah, so when it comes to influences, I've always realized there's like the artists that influence me because of their music and there's the artists that influence me because of kind of what they stand for, right? Um, so in terms of like what they stand for, um, Anna Lino has been a big influence mm -hmm. to me just because she's such a like a role model in the electronic scene. like as a female producer um, and guest selector that's just really like come up. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of her earlier sounds have really influenced me, like her early collab collaborations with Flume, um, her like, super kind of thumping like dance beats, and even though her sound kind of progressed into something like a little different, um, a lot more bass heavy, which is not really what I play anymore, um, I still really look up to her like just as an idol and just a super down to earth person that continuously um, inspires like, other female artists yeah. like myself to really do the passion about. Um, in terms of music, um, when I first got into the scene, I was really influenced by a lot of um, the kind of like disco house heads, like Guido Mesh is probably one of my first influences, like Black Stories, like previous sounds, probably my first influences, The Magician has always been a big influence mm -hmm. on me. 
um, those are the kind of sounds I was really into. And now, as I take a step back, I'm getting a lot more into more of the old, like, soulful house people. So I've been listening to all Frankie Knuckles, like, old boiler room sets. Mm -hmm. um, the head candy label was always a big influence on me, and I've been going back into, like, their old mixes and really trying to dig for gold there. Um, and I think just, like, kind of taking the reins on Disco House and just you know, finding the real, genuine, like, disco house sound, like, what it was before is what I'm really looking for now. Like, a yeah. lot of the really commercial disco house coming out right now is, like, not really what I'm feeling. So what would you say is one of the bigger milestones that we're working towards achieving? Interesting. Um, I think right now it's really just track releases. Um, I think when it comes to shows, I've been doing pretty well at getting the shows that I want and now I think I want to um, I want to focus more on producing the music that I really identify with and then eventually kind of move beyond like an opening slot and being more like direct support for the headliners that I've been playing with. Yeah. So right now a lot of it's been me opening for someone who then opens for the headliner and that's fine, um, but I know if I was to progress like any further, then I would really like release my own tracks and get my own music out there. So that's really the milestone that I'm going for. Okay. And so we want to get to know you a little bit better, so we'll get into some of the more personal questions. Okay. Um, so tell us about how your family's been. Have they been supportive yeah. the entire time and what your relationship is with music and them right now? Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, so my family are Indian. Um, but they migrated to Australia when I was super young, so we kind of have that cross-cultural like influence. And while my parents can be somewhat traditional, they're also very open to like you know the Western culture and you know Western influences. So my mom put me in like singing and dance classes since I was like really little. Um, but she also wanted to expose me to like our our own culture. So I was in like an Indian singing and dancing for a really long time. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I don't think my mom really expected me to do it as like a actual like a job. job. Yeah, it's weird because I think it's like a job. Yeah, I don't know. yeah, like it kind of is. Yeah, yeah, career. Um, I think it was always just supposed to be like a creative like influence on whatever I did. So I, you know, and I kind of treated it that way as well for like a really long time. I was like, hey, I don't even know where this is gonna go, so I'll just keep it as a hobby. Um, and then at first when I did it, my parents were like, this is just sort of like a hobby, right? It's like, a phase. Like, yeah, it's just like a little like thing. And then when I kept doing it, I think my mom started to see, especially my mom started to see how passionate I was about it. And then when I started putting tracks out, that's when she could really see something like tangible and she was always been so supportive, mm -hmm. um, especially when it's good. And the good thing about my mom is that she is also like a critic, so she's not just gonna be like, oh, it's good. This is great. It. Yeah, like, this is great. This sucks. <laughs> yeah, because you're my daughter. But, um, so she'll like push me until it's something like really different. Um, and, you know, I think, um, I think overall my parents have been like pretty supportive, and as I release music and they see whether it's like successful or not, like mm -hmm. they'll gradually become like more supportive there as well. Yeah. What did you think you were going to be when you were a kid? Oh, <laughs> um, oh, I honestly had no idea. Um, I knew it was something that would be a little out of the ordinary. I just knew I would lead a less conventional life, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, something with a position of influence. I didn't know if that was politics. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if that was being a musician, <laughs> but definitely something like influential. Um, wouldn't necessarily I thought it was going to be like famous or something, mm -hmm. but I didn't have like a good answer for that ever when I was little. Yeah. And what else are you passionate about outside of working on your music? Um, I love coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do love coffee. Um, I think when I'm, I always say when I'm like 40, I'm probably going to start a rooftop cafe somewhere. Um, I love learning about coffee. I love just trying different cafes. I used to have this rule where I could not get coffee from the same place two days in a row. Mm -hmm. And then I always had to find a different cafe. You tried all the I tried all the in the area. Yeah. Obviously not Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I feel you on that. Yeah. Um, so really passionate about that. I'm really passionate about technology. So my day job is in marketing, is in marketing technology. Mm -hmm. And I know that um, I definitely want to like start something and do something in music technology eventually. 
so really passionate about um, different experiences. Um, so for example, with like the Google, like, you know, simulator right now, like what we do with that could be live stream in an artist from Europe that does not have like a visa to perform in America, you know, could I live stream over to like my childhood friends in like Australia, like what the different kinds of experiences technology can give us um, through music. So that's something that I'm really passionate about growing. Do you think that your day job kind of goes hand in hand or complements what you do with music? It really does because so much of music and being an artist is branding and marketing and promoting yourself. And I've done so many like marketing strategies and branding strategies and content strategies that I know exactly what I what could be effective when it comes to promoting a show and like what content people find is like relevant to them and how to like get people like interested. Um, and that's what's so important and that's what I do on a day-to-day -day basis for all these different brands. So they definitely just go hand in hand from that respect. Yeah. And tell us a, a guilty pleasure of yours <laughs> or a hidden talent that most may not know about. You might have to show oh. us. <laughs> oh my god, okay. So what I was gonna say, I don't want to show you. I'm not gonna do this. <laughs> Maybe I'm gonna do it after. <laughs> when I was 15, I won a yodeling contest in Switzerland um, in Lucerne. Okay. So maybe that's a hidden talent. I don't know. Let's see. Well, I'll be the judge of that. <laughs> you wanna give it a go? Okay. <laughs> Probably not right now. But um, and then what I won was this huge bucket of beer. Like I was underage, so I couldn't uh -huh. drink it. But yeah. I wonder if that's still a hidden talent it could be. Mm -hmm. um, guilty pleasure. I'm trying to think what a guilty pleasure is. Oh, I definitely still listen to like back in the day pop music. I'm the biggest Mariah Carey fan. Like uh -huh. I'm a Walt Disney fan, and I definitely still throw on her number one album. Like, yeah. Here or there. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely like a guilty that's, pleasure. That's not. That's not too bad. <laughs> Do you have a most valuable possession? Um, right now it's my space jacket. <laughs> <laughs> um, I get so scared when I wake up in the morning after a show that I've like lost it or like left it somewhere. Um, um, other than that, my prized possession um, is this is gonna sound really like cheesy, but it's probably just my like my laptop or my music because mm -hmm. it's got it's, there's just so much history there like. My dad used to travel a lot growing up, and every time he was in a different country, he'd bring me back like a CD with like that country's like music, and so much of that is like loaded onto that computer, and that computer is kind of like my external brain right now. So yeah. that's really like my my yeah. prized possession. <laughs> and what's one word that you would use to describe yourself? Oh wow. <laughs> um, energy. Okay. <laughs> And first, um, at Neon Owl, we partner up with different charities. We try to partner up with artists and fans to give back. If you can see us get more involved with a specific cause, like what do you think that would be? Yeah, um, so I don't know if there's a specific cause that does this right now. Um, but what I would really like to get more involved in is helping kids or even people of any age with less financial means. Um, to have the resources they need to expose themselves to like music technology, production, um, if that's something they just haven't been able to afford. Um, you know, when it comes to making music and producing, it's it's an investment. Like you invest in equipment, you invest in like program software, sometimes you invest in classes, and not everyone has the means to do that. So, but I think that's fair. I think it causes like a huge imbalance like in the industry when we certain people have access to it and others don't. So that is something that I really feel passionately about and want to help yeah. um, And what's something that you feel like the world can use more of? I think the world could use more people that are just willing to like give and like collaborate and share and be like open because I think that's really just what brings like everyone together. That's really what brought me and a lot of the community I'm a part of together but also doing that more like across borders and across like countries um, and giving different people in different environments of technology to like to do that. Yeah, so. okay. And I always like to close out with something like, um, you know, what you're working towards right now and how do you want to be remembered as beyond your music and beyond your time? What, what yeah. would that be? Um, I would love to be 
remembered as someone that like somehow I guess like somehow made a difference and that might, might sound really cheesy but whether or not I make it quote unquote big you know <laughs> I just want to know that I've like paved the way for other people who might have been facing the similar struggles to me to succeed and do it and like you know make a difference so whether I close a ripple or make a big splash like I just want to remember someone that like made a difference and what's the best way for everyone to get a hold of you and your music? Oh, um, soundcloud.com <laughs> slash Aki Music World. You can just direct message me anytime or message me through my fan page. I'm very responsive. I read everything um, and always appreciate um, people supporting and, you know, just dropping a nice word like here and there. So always feel free to contact me. Awesome. Well, you're amazing and I can't wait to catch your next step. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. <laughs>